This channel is part of the History Hit Network. We're in Burma, where historic drama has just unfolded. Let me set the scene for you a little bit. Like in any country, the fight over the throne has been tough. Good. Ubi Eda is good. <laughs> In fact, the fight is still ongoing as we speak. Okay. Could you look me in the eye, please? Yes. Like in many countries, the road towards democracy has been long. But nowhere has a dream turned so fatally into a tragedy as in Burma. But we don't know that yet. Before the tragedy, there was hope. Before that, it all began with a woman and a military. A lot of people in downtown, they take to the street, holding whatever weapon available. Uh, I can hear some gunshots now coming from downtown. I think most probably it is, it is taking place in front of the city hall. On the eighth day of the eighth month, in 88, the military violently cracked down an uprising by the people. to do is to keep out of politics. We don't want the military to split up. We want the armed forces to keep, to keep together, but to keep out of politics. The military put Aung San Suu Kyi in house arrest and kept her there for nearly 20 years. One day, the military announced that they were ready to step down from power and make real democracy. They had made a seven-step roadmap to follow. The plan was enshrined in what was to become their most sacred book, the Constitution. After decades of hard power, it looked like the military was ready to exchange the uniforms for suits and the swords for words. You know, the roadmap is very important for our country transformation of the country into a democratic state, we have to take step by step, systematically. There's a seven-step roadmap, which was announced by our prime minister on the 30th of August, and now we are implementing this roadmap. And the release but, of Ms. Suki, will it come very soon? But everything is, uh, you know, we are working for the best. Thank you very much. They did release her but under their conditions. They had put a clause in the Constitution that specifically barred her from ever becoming Burma's president. 
The Burmese pro-democracy leader Aung San Suu Kyi has been released by the country's military rulers. The moment that many thousands of Burmese people have been waiting for for years. Aung San Suu Kyi, a free woman, she waved and smiled at the thousands who'd gathered to witness this historic moment. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. From the Battle of Trafalgar and the Revolutionary Era, right through to the Second World War, if you are looking for your next military history fix, then this is the service for you. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. On the 11th day of the 11th month, 1,100 battalions were sent to the driest part of the country to inaugurate a new capital with a new parliament. In 2011, the military installed a so-called civilian government. They had promised the people democracy, and so they would get. ตํารอบ่มาตํารอหนาเลยไปบ่รัวบาเลยตํารอหนาเลยลุชินเอ่อตํารอจ้องหมดติยินตํารอหนาเลยตํารอซ้อเลยลุไปติไรไม่มีห
the most prominent of the military generals, took off their green military uniforms and put on the white civilian outfits. Many generals stayed in uniform, but the country was now to be governed by the leaders in white. ကျွန်တော်ကိုနလိုငံတော်သမရဆွဲလဲဆွဲအောက်ခွဲဖွဲ့တယ်ကျွန်တော်ကိုနလိုငံတော်သမရအက်ဆွဲလဲဆွဲ
international community ya lemkan ne twa jaw amye ran twa pyaw pe bo twa asin tin phiaw chu sa ke de ye for your western country point of view military coup and the military play important role in the politics you cannot accept that Clearly understand, for the sake of our country, military cannot involve in the politics for a long term. Time is you are from your two table, you know, but you need me. You think that you know now, John, I don't know, Nina Sailor, you know, a big kind of society, feeling you know, choose out here. I see you when I got up, I shall when I look on no peckle. Even American solution, American Tamaram, you know, I'm not a common Malabu. ตัวอย่างเหมือนมันเองเจ้าอชีนี่มานี่ก็เจ้าโกรงกระดูกเสียงเปล่าเลยไม่ตีได้เลยเนี่ยมีอะไรเดโมกราซีนี่ก็เจ
when the president made the decision to meet the Aung San Suu Kyi, most party members are suspicious of the Aung San Suu Kyi. The Aung San Suu Kyi and during a military government, there's a quite different on ideas. So some make the remark behind the president's back. The Utain Singh is trying to give in the life to the already dead tiger. A historic moment for Myanmar as the country's pro-democracy leader Aung San Suu Kyi is elected to parliament. The opposition National League for Democracy claims the Nobel laureate has easily won the majority of seats in her constituency just outside the city of Yangon. I think some of the reformist ex-generals and the president at the time went a little bit beyond the script in terms of the liberalizations that took place, the freeing of political prisoners, the outreach to the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi and others. And I think this tested the margins of what the establishment as a whole was probably also willing to tolerate. And so I think for those who wanted to push reform from within the government and from within the system, they also had to think about what might trigger a, a backlash. And no one was really quite clear what the whole game of politics was, was meant to be. So she arrived and took the steps into the corridors of power. But she wasn't prepared to start playing by the rules that deliberately excluded herself from power. She wanted to change the rules from within. Pro-democracy leader Aung San Suu Kyi has taken her place in Myanmar's parliament, ushering in a new political era after years of military dictatorship. The Nobel Peace Laureate and other newly elected members of her party pledge to safeguard the constitution. It's quite a change for a woman who's been incarcerated most of the last 20 years. So when it arrived, at the Instituto. There are a lot of media. I told them, hey, rebels are coming, rebels are coming. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, we are rebels. We have struggled along so many years, nearly three decades. And they regarded as as a above ground insurgent, not underground. <laughs> Aung San Suu Kyi and her party only hold eight percent of seats in parliament, so at first glance they don't seem to have much leverage. <laughs> Our objective was to continue our struggle for, based on our political principles. To amend the constitution and to get truly democratic state. I have a tremendous goodwill towards the military, so it doesn't in any way bother me to sit with them. I'm pleased to be sitting together with them. But you would like to either reduce their presence or not have them in the parliament? We, we would like our parliament to be in line with genuine democratic values. It's not because we want to remove anybody as such. Lack of confidence. If you have to pinpoint one, the, the greatest weakness, that's it, lack of trust and confidence. The, nobody trusts anybody. <laughs> uh, this, this is a result of years and years of dictatorship, authoritarian rule. You all have, have to be careful. You don't know who's informing on whom. And this lack of trust has seeped into our very bones, in a sense. So this does not help to bring about reconciliation.
After 20 years in confinement, the people's leader had entered parliament. The air was filled with hope and anticipation. The world suspended the sanctions and the country was lifted out of isolation for the first time in 50 years. It was a historic moment. The international community believes that we are ongoing trust on what we are moving our reform. That is, you know, so wonderful. Even U.S. President Sir Hillary Clinton and U.K. Prime Minister and your, you know, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, King Norway. And Japan, all the whole people, the whole, you know, uh, president, prime minister, and also, they visit to Myanmar. That is a great change. The great changes in Myanmar. That is so important. Within a short time, it's very difficult to get trust within a short time. Even American solution, American Tamara, Yamanayamatakama, Malahu, Chanola Tama, Obama, Niji, you love it. Running a Yana, you look even in a Sasan and Pajar, Chanoru, Chuchizua, Panagalu, Coin Lani, General Toroli Yare, or see why Peso Tare Tajar, Tichagal, and Mujiri, Sua Sasama, Tinshiri, Jumiri, Jumiri, which are Piamio Masana, Jumiri Masana in Etajar. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Dasu, uh, you helped set this country on a better path. And in the past two years, important changes have been made. Uh, the economy has begun to grow. Political prisoners have been set free. Uh, there are more newspapers and media outlets. Children have been released from the military, and these are all important changes that have opened up greater opportunity for the people of Burma. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's clear how much hard work remains to be done and that many difficult choices still lie ahead. And as Burma approaches important national elections next year, it will be critical to ensure that all of Burma's people can participate in shaping the future of their country. Well, I've always said that it's somewhat flattering to have a constitution written with me in mind. But it shouldn't be done that way. That's not how a democratic constitution should be written. Now the current situation, the Don San Suu Kyi has the power, not only the power, she already has the Oza in Myanmar languages. Oza is, you know, the combination of the aspiration, motivation, love, respect. So this is a very powerful, what we call soft power. Sometimes the military leader fee, they are not well appreciated by the people of Myanmar and the international community because what they do doing for their country and what they are intended to move toward the democracy in our country. While the leaders in white continued their efforts, the devil lied in the detail. In the sacred book, the Constitution, the military had stated that none of the generals could ever be prosecuted for sins of the past.
nor could any civilian government ever rule over the military. And they would keep the ministries of security, border and defense within their power. A quarter of the seats in parliament were reserved for the military to ensure that the book itself could never be changed without their will. Oh, and one last detail put in the book. Aung San Suu Kyi could never become the country's president. ตรุนี่ก็ทอกุอ่ะชิเซชิกันนี่ซะพี่รอดิเสียอนาชินี่ก็ตองซันซูจีโกแล้วอันนี้มีบ่อันนี้มีตรุเซนซะพี่รอม
I think that's what happened. He's a very smooth operator. He's a politician. He's thinking of personal agenda. He's thinking of the those days he will become the president. But up to now, Tom Sansu is a very few knowledge about the, how the government system is working, what happened in the last 20 years in the, the military and the government side. So I think whether he liked it or she liked it or not, he, she needed someone who have to give the, share the knowledge and give the advice. She's planning well, how to move, play uh, with these uh, uh, some people in the military. I think that uh, she uh, think that will be walkable uh, with the Shuman, you see. But in the politics, there was no friend or no enemy at all, you see. At the time, some men will be friend, sometimes will be uh, and maybe enemy. Uh, oh, okay. Sometimes hostility and sometimes friendship, OK? Okay. <laughs> ตอนซันซูจีอนัยยะชีบิรอตุเนตอนซันซูจีสะบีตุ้ยแกบาเดตีแกบาเดตุ้ยจ้องเลยนาเลแกบาเดอลุซาเอ็มพูซุยตุเ
40 years in the military life together with us. He betrayed the military. So every, the whole world military core didn't accept like that. The amendment bill was not enacted, Parliament Speaker Thura Oshiman told the legislature after the 388 votes in favor of change fell below the threshold of 75% of lawmakers needed for it to pass. But things didn't turn out his way. Having betrayed the military, he never got the chance to run for the presidency. ဒီကြာလိုက်တော့ရောက်ကြီးတိုင်းကြီးရုံကြည့်ကိုတနတ်နာကြီးတော့မှာရောက်ရဲ့ကြီးမှာတော့ဒီကြာလိုက်တော့
And Mayan became the Tibo step. As the spiritual guardians of the country, the monks and the astrologers had always had a powerful role in society and a vital say in all aspects of Burmese life. Mayan was different. He was chosen to lead the army because the old man checked his astrol astrology. That's why he became the commander of the army. <laughs> Not his military proficiency. <laughs> his stars are at the top. The old man's biggest fear was the woman that had always been in his way. Even with her in house arrest, had he engaged four astrologers to foresee any threat that could come from her side. With 59F in place, had he finally released her. And only with that secure, could his seven-step roadmap move forward to its final stage to hold free and fair elections. They chose the election date on November 8, 2015. One of the top astrologers advised. So if it was held on the 8th November 2015, you will win a landslide victory. of the whole country is that they will, they will win handsomely. But as, a, as you know, the result was quite the opposite. By dusk, Results were coming in thick and fast. In one big city, they captured 100% of votes. The party of the fighting peacock. Aung San Suu Kyi and the people of Myanmar have waited 25 years, and the NLD, the National League for Democracy, her party, has won that crucial majority to get to this point today. One of the top astrologers advised but sometimes they are totally wrong. <laughs> but losing, losing the election, he went to, to a village and shaved his head and became a monk. Even with the election victory safe, the battle was not over. So Aung San Suu Kyi wrote letters to meet the commander of the army and the president. But she got no replies. Anna 
For 70 years, vicious wars had been fought against the country's ethnic minorities. Wars that justified the military's existence as guardians of the sovereignty of the nation. Were she to get the throne, she would inherit a deeply wounded country. Then one day, she received an invitation not from the one she expected, but directly from the old man. She was able to meet with Senior General Tan Shui. And there, he, she admitted that you must be the leader of our future, something like that. We discussed that we hope that transition will be smooth. At the same time, we are expecting for the future of government and co in cooperation with the military, military commanders. We don't have any intention of uh, reprisal or retaliation of the previous past events. We're just looking forward for the betterment of the people. No, I think there's a mostly about, you know, she maybe she want to grant the, the safety of the uh, Senior General Tan Shui and the family. And also maybe she, General Tan Shui said he, he will also the ready to accept the decision made by the, the people. I think there's a, some, something like the mutual interest on both sides. With the blessing of the old man, suddenly everybody was ready to meet her and negotiate the conditions of a transfer of power. ကျန်တော်လူတော်မပြောတာဘူးကျွန်တော်ကလက်ဒီအာနာကိုကျွန်တော်ဆက်ပြီးတော့မယူခြင်းတော့ဘူးဒါမှာလည်းအာနာဆ
So you have to understand that there's a two options for the energy government. The one is using all your energy and resources to fight to amend the constitution, especially the 95F. Or you will work the first two years established in the trust between the military and the energy. So I think the Dong San Suu Kyi, she select the second option. All those who are in a position to change the course of the history of our country must agree at some point that we are going to take that part and path and not the other one. She pledged uh, she will work very closely with the military and the, uh, the former official like the President Uday Singh in the future affair of that state. The leaders in white stepped down and let Aung San Suu Kyi take their place. From now on, she would have to cooperate directly with the commander of the army, the military in its true colors. So the main thing is we didn't, both sides didn't want to block the boat. The election victory would finally be rewarded and new colors filled the parliament. Aung San Suu Kyi could lead her party that now held a ruling majority, but could never become president. They would be sitting next to the military, who stayed to guard the book and kept key ministries within their power. It seemed that despite decades of struggle, she would be tied to them in ruling the kingdom. But then, they had always been bound together. In the 1940s, General Aung San led the fight for Burma's independence against the British colonial powers. The country needed unity and strength to gather on the inside and to protect itself on the outside. But it was no easy task because the country was rich and varied it had rivers and mountainous areas, hills and jungles, and a number of ethnic and religious people. Karen, Kareni, Chin, Kachin, Shan, Mon, Rakhine. Aung San proposed to unite all the country's people and founded Burma's independence army. By standing together, they could get the British out and he succeeded. It was at an early hour, specially chosen by Burmese astrologers, that Rangoon marked Burma's full assumption of independence. In place of the Union Jack, the Burmese national flag was hoisted with all due ceremony. Shortly after, Aung San was brutally assassinated by political rivals. Wars broke out with the ethnic people. The people lost their founding father, but he had left them a military and a daughter. She always mentioned that she was brought up in the hands of the NCOs around her father. He had a fashion, whoever is in the army, but they are still, do not accept the rule of the Aung this person a grudge. Well, as you know, since independence, when her father was assassinated, 
it was a known fact that he's the architect of our independence. He's the founder of Bama Army. So they were the sons or grandsons of Bojo Aung San. And then when Milti government took over, Ami is the father, Ami is the mother. For now, they would share the kingdom and were tied together as brother and sister. But she wasn't going to give up her plan to unseat the military from the palace. After all, she was the true heir to the throne. The constitution bars her from becoming the president, but today she threw down the gauntlet to the Myanmar military. The constitution says nothing about somebody being above the president. I said I'm going to be above the president. How? Oh. oh, I've already made plans. Thank you very much. Quite what she intends isn't clear. But the constitution, she said, would not present an impossible obstacle. Namroda goes to Lerriga, Mataja, Tangua Kejavarishi. Adina, Obata Uiminga, do you resemble Taukan to Nyaraja, Tipu Jam Jinya Pirati? The bomber to Shiba the Lao, Mimia Yama, Namroda goes to Alunga, Mataja, Tangua Kejavare. Constable of the state means. The, all the president, all the uh, all the chief of the department, well under control now. It's a very wise step, you see. And they accuse us. What is that? Democratic dictatorship. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> I like the terminology. <laughs> now she is control of state. Me control everywhere, every 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 ministry. She like a tiger on a bull. She never let it go. <laughs> it's a credit to the late Ukoni. He was an expert in constitutional literature. So he lived through all the articles and he found one loophole that the president can create a position for anybody or any status. Well, I'll make all the decisions. It's as simple as all that. If I'm required to field a president who meets the requirements of um, Section 59F of the Constitution, all right, we'll find one. This person will carry out <coughs> whatever wishes he have a thought on to see. And even now, the president is a uh, uh, schoolmate. And very simple, very uh, soft man, and soft thinking, soft spoken. As the president, the, NH, the president will carry out any sort of things to comply with her desire, you see. So, so she can want everything now, more than president now, you see. Now she can handle everything, you see. So that is why we cleverly move that, that again, again, able to carry out by Dr. Chachi uh, all of the uh, powers, because we have a majority of the votes of the parliament, so we won. Actually, she didn't have all the powers. While she had learned the game well and played by the rules, the military hadn't left the stage, and they responded with their language. Violence. On 
Sunday afternoon, Myanmar state-run news MRTV reported that one of the government legal advisors to Aung San Suu Kyi was shot and killed by a Seoul gunman. Police have a suspect in custody. Kony was shot dead at Yangon International Airport January 29th while holding his young grandchild. Despite many unanswered questions regarding the murder of Ukoni, many here in Myanmar see it as a sign the government of Aung San Suu Kyi has yet to firmly establish the rule of law. The murder is also seen as a warning to those who want to reduce the power of the military. Police say his killer's motives were unpolitical, but one of his friends believes he was murdered because of his legal work. We sense that he was hated by other, some people, but I didn't expect to that vicious. As if it is, actually it's a mafia. Still, the, the main cover is still missing. Ukoni was shot directly in the head in front of the Yangon International Airport. He was immediately taken to Yangon Hospital where he was pronounced dead. Aung San Suu Kyi didn't attend the funeral. She stayed silent and withdrew from the public eye. She's shrewd. She can guess the main reason. She says something, it will get worse. Is it some kind of warning for her that if you go too far? Maybe, maybe. But there was another problem with this lawyer. He was a Muslim. Back in 1947, when Aung San had united the country's ethnic people, one group was believed to have stayed on the British side. The ruling Buddhist majority agreed that they were traitors and that they did not belong in the country. The Muslim Rohingyas. The Buddhists called them Bengalis, considered people that had come from abroad. <laughs> Well, Rakhine was a time bomb that was ticking. So you had this rising uh, Rakhine uh, nationalist feeling, um, and where these two communities, Muslim and Buddhist, also began to see each other, not just began, but increasingly saw each other as uh, their main enemies as well. Uh, and then you had, I think, not surprisingly, the emergence in 2016 on the Muslim side, uh, a new insurgency and a very militant insurgency. The group is poorly equipped. It has guns, small homemade bombs, and what it describes as a narrow mission to protect Rohingya Muslims. <laughs> The deep-rooted Rakhine conflict was toxic, and there were powerful interests at stake. To bring peace to the region, 
and human rights to the oppressed people. Aung San Suu Kyi needed a powerful ally. And so, turned to the international community for help. You know, Kofi Annan, he, she invited Kofi Annan. So, someday, you have the, your family and your wife, uh, your husband and your children quarreling in your home. You call all the people and look what happened. That's sometimes it is a little bit difficult. You should do yourself first. Tomorrow, we will start planning for the time. You will see for yourself what the problems on the ground are. You will be able to assess for yourself what the roots of the problems are. Not in one day, not in one week. But I'm confident that you will get that. The Rohingya Muslims were stateless. Aung San Suu Kyi had promised to implement the findings of the commission, knowing that it would lead to citizenship for the Rohingya Muslims. What she couldn't know was that this was to become the Achilles heel of a lifelong project for peace and democracy. Hundreds of people have rallied in Myanmar to denounce an advisory commission led by visiting former UN chief Kofi Annan. The Buddhist majority in Rakhine insists foreigners can't understand the region's history. It's very narrow path to damage control that problems. It is big problems. For example, for our naval aspect, your ship's heading by the can. No problem. Hit it by torpedo. Mm, no problem. Hit it by nuclear bone. Sorry. Now, after August 25th, nuclear bone hit Myanmar. Authorities say some 150 insurgents launched a series of raids on police posts in the early hours. Rohingya fighters attacked army and police posts in Rakhine State on Thursday night, just hours earlier. Former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan had announced the findings of a year-long investigation into the mistreatment of the Rohingya minority in Myanmar. Just one day after Kofi Annan had delivered the final report, the attacks had captured the agenda and any plan to give citizenship to the Rohingyas had been disrupted. For the military, the situation provided an opportunity to respond and to get rid of a problem altogether. The army has begun what it calls clearance operations to root out Rohingya fighters. The brutal Burmese military operation against Rohingya Muslims is at risk of spiraling into an ethnic cleansing campaign as the violence against the long persecuted minority group continues. The Burmese response was to close the area and the army began what it called clearance operations. Civilians as well as militants have been targeted. Army has its own agenda without our knowledge, without consulting us. They have the right to do anything what they like. We can do what they like. We cannot interfere or order them what to do. 
The UN says almost 150,000 Rohingyas have fled the predominantly Buddhist country into neighboring Bangladesh in the last 12 days since the military operation began. The current situation cannot yet be fully assessed, but the situation remains or seems a textbook, uh, textbook example of ethnic cleansing. She had invited the international community in. Now they expected her to respond and to condemn the military. The one thing she couldn't do. She had accepted to work under the constitution, which gave her no power over military affairs. The consequences of that deal were now being realized. But as the crisis worsened by the minute, her immediate response was denial. I'm deeply disappointed and saddened by the disinformation campaign being waged around the world with regard to the situation in Rakhine. These fabricated news items are written and published with the intent to mislead the public. Aung San Suu Kyi, the country's leader, said the situation in Rakhine state was being distorted by what she called a huge iceberg of misinformation. The kind thing is blew up in our face without any expectation. The government has rejected accusations that the armed forces are conducting a campaign of indiscriminate violence targeting Rohingya Muslims. Ministry of Interior, uh, Home Ministry, Defense and Border Areas are controlled by the army. So when the kind thing happened, international community blamed also that she was protecting the army. The reason was that she doesn't want to make any hostile remark to the army for the long run. But she was blamed for that. That's why they call it military trap. Nobel Peace Prize laureate Aung San Suu Kyi, who is now Burma's de facto president, is facing mounting criticism for her handling of the violence. Last year, she attacked... And Nobel Peace laureate Aung San Suu Kyi has blamed terrorists for what she termed, quote, a huge iceberg of misinformation. ...amounts to ethnic cleansing. Suu Kyi herself won the Nobel Peace Prize. Nobel Peace Prize sharply criticized Myanmar's leader Aung San Suu Kyi for not doing enough to protect the country's minorities. She's seeking to deflect the Rohingya crisis that so far sent almost 150,000 Rohingya Muslims free. She should use her voice, that's true, and she hasn't, and that's deeply disappointing. Silent and in many cases complicit in messaging on this issue. I think when you get power, you go into a cocoon. You go into an us against them attitude. I think. Mei Online knows, Mei Online, that senior general Mei Online knows the problem and then she, she's enjoying the situation. While Aung San Suu Kyi had put herself above the president, there was one man who was ultimately above them all, the commander of the army. The commander of the army was accountable to no one, but the commander of the army. He held the monopoly on violence and could take back full power of the country whenever he liked, as history had proven. For the military, the situation was not a crisis. It was an opportunity to bring her down. Many so she may keep silent on this thing. Maybe in the future she worry she will not get a vote or maybe that kind of thing. Maybe, maybe.
while the military kept the conflict rolling. The outside world demanded clear answers from the state leader. From their front row seats in the audience, the military watched her enter the scaffold. After intense pressure, Aung San Suu Kyi finally addressed the Rohingya refugee crisis. This televised address to diplomats was Ms. Suu Kyi's chance to state her case to the world. It is not the intention of the Myanmar government to apportion blame or to abnegate responsibility. We condemn all human rights violations and unlawful violence. We are committed to the restoration of peace, stability and rule of law throughout the state. The government has been making every effort to restore peace and stability and to promote harmony between the Muslim and Rakhine communities. I'm aware of the fact that the world's attention is focused on the situation in the kind state. But we would like you to think of our country as a whole, not just as little afflicted areas. I want to know that the Rohingya are not going to be able to do it. Aung San Suu Kyi has made her choice. Her relationship with the military and the stability of her government comes before the Rohingya and what's left of her international reputation. Her long-term vision to get the military out of politics seemed further away than ever. Yet, she had decided to stay on the inside and persevere. As the daughter of the founding general of the army, she was born with a destiny to lead the country and the military. In that sense, she was ultimately above them all. Prominent qualities of was that she was honest, straightforward, sometimes too good to respond. Well, that's our nature. In some cases, she became mature. Her attitude to everybody, she wanted to be a mother to them. During 1988, she was sometimes impulsive, but politically very wise. When I watch her movement and speeches and everything, dealing with the people, I became impressed. I thought myself she could become a leader of the country. She 
she assumed herself as a mother. So she tried to formulate how to treat them, how to communicate with, with them, whether general or ethnic people or whoever he may be. Her attitude is she doesn't want to take action against anybody. She, she would like to give uh, some kind of lessons. And she would like to change their attitude with moral leadership. Everybody is in equal in her own assumption, but it depends on their feedback. He's good, it's quite all right. He's bad, she'll try to control him or she won't take action against him. She'll try to tame him patiently. She grew up amongst the generals, so she spoke the language they knew in order to tame them, change their military minds, to stop them thinking like dictators. But while they continued their struggle over who would be true heir to the throne, the head of the family, the king of kings, it happened, like in any family, that even the fiercest of foes end up looking more like than they differ. Like brother, like sister. Ten lanes. Ten lanes there, ten lanes here, it's twenty lanes. You can drive close your eyes. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> Do you know where they live? Bhutan Shui and previous military commanders. And also Uten Sei. Well, I'll show you. <laughs> they stay with the full security details. Huge mansions. This is the place. Bhutan Shui, Stacy is also here. Hiroshima here. And as to the president house there. Well, she stays in a house that is meant for the ministers. And each mansion there about three acres. They all live in the same place. Yeah, immediate neighbors. Behind closed doors, far away from the people and the world, they kept their fight on going all the while the country was falling apart at the seams. The entire area has been burned out. Uh, the residents are evidently all gone. You, you know, it shows a, a, a clear swath of destruction, presumably caused by arson. These satellite images from Human Rights Watch show the of the destruction there. Uh, it shows that, once again, the government of Burma does not have the situation under control. The fact-finding mission has concluded, on reasonable grounds, that the patterns of gross human rights violations and serious violations of international humanitarian law that it has found amount to the gravest crimes under international law. Genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. The main perpetrator of the serious human rights violations outlined in our report, including of the acts of sexual violence, is the Myanmar military. We are deeply disappointed that State Councillor Dao Aung San Suu Kyi has not used her position 
or her moral authority to stem, prevent, or condemn the unfolding events in Black Iron State. Let me be clear, Mr. President, there is no ethnic cleansing. There is no genocide. The leaders of Myanmar, who have long been striving for freedom and human rights, will not espouse such policies. The outside world can choose the issues on which they wish to focus. We who are living through the transition in Myanmar view it differently from those who observe it from the outside and who will remain untouched by its outcome. For us, it is a broad, all-encompassing map of the future of our country, as well as the small details of our everyday life. I think the country is in an emergency situation. I think that we have a country of endemic ethnic and religious conflict. One of the poorest countries in the region, opening up to the world. The crisis has been devastating. It's had a knock-on effect on the possibility of transition as a whole. The feeling on the outside that the government has not responded in anything like a satisfactory way has led to an intense cooling of relations between the international community through the United Nations with the Myanmar government. We're still living in a world of more or less exactly the same mentalities that had existed before, and it extends way beyond the army. I mean, you know, like it or not, I mean, this is, this is, uh, army rule has been around for longer than I've been alive, I mean, for more than well over 50 years, half a century. So it's not just the army, it's everything else has been shaped by army rule. And so it's not a country which was democratic five years ago and can snap back to democratic practices. Everything has to start with where we were a few years ago uh, under army rule, but again on the, on the uh, tail end of seven decades of violent conflict as well. The 8,333rd meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is the situation in Myanmar. The massive refugee emergency that began one year ago in Rakhine State, Myanmar, has become one of the world's worst humanitarian and human rights crises. The world can no longer avoid the difficult truth of what happened the in Rome. The population of Rakhine State was subjected to a campaign of worst catastrophes in our modern history, resulting in grave violations of their human rights and indeed exposure. have led to the displacement of some 900,000 people of Rakhine State. Military police went from house to house. Reports of systematic and widespread human rights violations and abuses against the Rohingya community in Rakhine State. As well as I now give the floor to the representative of Myanmar. Mr. President, our gathering here today could have been a different one had there been no terrorist attack. It would have been a happier occasion to stop taking implementation of the Rakhine Advisory Commission or an international pledging conference to help poverty alleviation. And so, <laughs> Sorry. And socioeconomic development of all communities in Rakhine. <clears throat> the provocative ter terrorist attacks of October 2016 and August <clears throat> 2017 have affected the cause of our earnest endeavor to build a peaceful, fair, fair and prosperous future for the people of Rakhine. But nothing shall stop our determination to continue our effort to achieve our objective.
So this is what it came to. Despite so much hope, they couldn't make it. Perhaps she was never who the world thought she was. Neither the villain, the world sees her as now. History is never over. But for the story I have told you, this is, unfortunately, the end.